Well, thank you everybody for coming along. I'm Karen, Karen Dark. I live in Inverness when I'm in the UK, although I do tend to be in other places on my bicycle quite a lot. But it's a privilege to be here with you tonight as part of this series of talks. And I've just put together um, a, a few images and stories from my background just to fill you in. I am a Paralympic athlete. I've spent the last 14 years with the Paralympic cycling squad racing for Britain and prior to that I used to just love being in the outdoors I'm not really naturally a competitively driven person I'm, I'm attracted to cycling purely for just the connection with nature and appreciation of the beautiful country that we live in and all the beautiful parts of the world so I think the stories I'll share with you tonight will represent that so we will just get going I've got loads of pictures to share with you and things um I'm going to aim to speak for about 40 minutes, then there'll be time to chat to me, uh, like we can have a conversation or ask questions at the end. One of the, well, I'll explain why this image is so pertinent as the talk goes on, I'm not going to tell you now, but I'm going to begin with just a quick video, it's well, about three minutes long, it's the best way just to give a really quick overview of my background, how I came to, so I'm going to make sure I've shared the sound, there we go, and how I came to be a Paralympic hand cyclist. Um, how strange, it's suddenly asking me to install a Zoom audio device to share the, hang on a sec, let's go again. Okay, hopefully that's gonna work. Let me know if you can hear the video okay. Okay. It's quite quiet, um, but we can. Okay. Yeah, that's not right. Sorry, everyone. Okay, I am going to try again. <laughs> Sorry about this. Hmm. I don't know why it's asking me for a password to be able to share my sound. Okay, let's try that. Hopefully it will be better this time. Upon your skin That I may have touched From without to within Well then dust yourself For fingerprints and grin And grin Cause we don't have to stay With these people Whose ideas are just what Other people say we can walk away From these feelings that are filling up our lives with days And I guess that I've been singing all my life Well that's right And that is fine I've been spending all your money and your time Well that's right And that is fine Cause I don't have to stay With these feelings that are filling up my life with days I can walk away From these people whose ideas are just what other people say And the crowd that is 
this guy that is confused We're all trembling inside in solitude We've got nothing left to use We got all the bullets But there's no one left to shoot And we can't walk away From these feelings That are filling up our lives with days We may have to stay With these people whose ideas are just what other people say But if heaven is a place upon your skin That I may have touched from without to within Well then dust yourself for fingerprints and grin And grin So the bit I forgot to say before that video began is that I actually really don't like that video. It gives this really glitzy idea that I'm just some kind of animal that keeps going and just keeps racing and that I've always been confident and none of that is true confidence is something that um has often been lacking for me I think many of us experience imposter syndrome and certainly I felt that right through my cycling career and in most other parts of my life along the way um but I think what what has driven me along is just to always be curious I like to ask you know who who am I what might be possible And I always kind of get over that step of the the bit where we maybe don't have the courage to step and do something different. I seem to manage to get through that. And I think that's why I'm able to go into these things and um, and try things out. So this is this just sums up my passion for cycling whenever I'm out there on a handbike because I'm paralyzed from the chest down. I think I just feel so free when I'm on my bike. Um, I just love to be out there in all kinds of landscapes. It doesn't really matter, but sharing it on my own or with other people or any kind of, you know, version of it, it's just, it fills my soul up so much. And I think my bike has been my my therapist and my friend and all these other kind of roles that it's played all the way through um, over the years. So um, I guess watching that video, it's a reminder that life is a roller coaster. It's up and down. And I suppose to me, the one constant is always my bike. So I think we sometimes have something like that that is our set point. And I know that if I've not had time riding in nature, then my set point and my balance just goes off. This last week, I've not been able to go out on my bike for various reasons. So I've not been out for um, about eight on nine days which for me is like the longest time and I finally got out this afternoon and I feel completely rejuvenated but whenever whenever the challenges of life crop up I see it as a bit of a call to adventure and I always like to think what can I learn from this how can I make the most of it and how might it how might this help in the future and I think that's you know people often ask me how have you got through some of the tough challenges and I know COVID has been a tough challenge for many people maybe not everybody but um I always like to be looking for the learning in it and how that might go forward in the future. And when I was first paralyzed, this was my view for at least three months, maybe four months. I was just laid in the hospital bed. I'd broken my neck as well. So I had bolts drilled in my skull and a metal halo around with weights hanging off it. And it was really hard looking at this this image on the ceiling to imagine ever having a life or an active life ever again. And of course, it was really um, difficult at first because you don't know what's possible when you don't know what is what the options are or what things you might be able to do or you don't know anybody in this new world that you've entered into it's really hard to use your imagination and to imagine but I was fortunate to be in this really sort of positive environment and I had a few things that really shifted my mindset and I think for me engaging with 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 exercise if you're not that way inclined it does require perhaps a shift of mindset. And when I became paralyzed, I was focusing on all the things I couldn't do. I was focusing on all the things I was bad at and all the things that were missing from my life instead of all the things I could do and all the opportunities. And it was this lady that I nicknamed the banana lady that changed it around for me. So she was paralyzed from the neck down. So she didn't have very good finger dexterity, but she spent every single day for six months learning to peel a banana and finally she managed to do it because she didn't have the grip or the ability to simply peel a banana without quite a trained and nuanced technique that she developed 
And it was such a, a moment for me when I thought, you know what, all of this, everything in life really is about making a decision, putting in the work, just going out every day. And then in those little steps that we take, we find so much joy and freedom and wonderful things that I have started to call our inner gold. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. So as I lay there in the hospital, I started to dream again. I started to think, what, what would be amazing? And I've invented this word. It stands for, wouldn't it be amazing? Having a wither. And my wither actually came through from something that some friends had been doing whilst I was in hospital. So on that boring ceiling, polystyrene ceiling, they had stuck posters of the Himalayas. And at first, when I looked at these pictures, I felt really depressed, thinking I, I can't even go to these places anymore. And then slowly, the seeds started to sink in that maybe there was a different way to go there. And so I started to dream again. And I had this, wouldn't it be amazing, this wither of going to the Himalayas on a hand bike. But it was starting from scratch. I knew nothing, not only about my whole life in a wheelchair and how to manage that, but also to find a way that this might be possible. With the help of Alpine Bikes, years ago, it was 1997, um, they supported us. We were fundraising for a Scottish charity that helps people with disabilities get into the mountains. And uh, I had this special bike made in Australia, which is a tandem that you pedal with your arms on the front and someone with the legs at the back. And decided to take this journey from the border of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, where you can see it, right through into Western China over the Tian Shan Mountains, and then across the western end of the Karakoram or the Himalayas into Pakistan. I mean, honestly, it seemed crazy. I'm laid in hospital bed. Actually, I started to invent this idea just after I got out of hospital, but it still seemed really, really far-fetched. And our training ride, our first training ride that you can see in this image at the bottom here was to the Outer Hebrides. I don't quite know why I thought the Outer Hebrides had anything in common with the Himalayas. But to cut a long story short, after a year or so of training, um, we did manage to take this trip. And we were traveling completely independently, carrying all our own stuff, no vehicles, my wheels on the back of the tandem and the frame of my wheelchair in a little trailer behind someone else's bike. And it was just this incredible transformational journey when we do something that we never thought we could and we pull it off. It's pretty special. And so I think it just took me to the next level of being able to dream again and to believe that maybe this life in a wheelchair wasn't going to be as bad as I first thought. Maybe adventure and these things would still be possible. And little did I know at this point, I had no idea where this would lead me. I had no idea that 15, almost 15 years later, I would end up on this Paralympic career path. I mean, it's just completely crazy where life can take us sometimes. So we're fast forwarding a big chunk of time here, but it's when you're in a wheelchair and you like sport, it's amazing how many people say to you, have you ever thought about going to the Paralympics? As if you can just enter it like a village fun run. And I think I naively thought that it would be like that. So I had no idea what I was letting myself in for, but I remember very distinctly watching the Beijing Paralympics in 2008, knowing that the next Paralympics was in London and just deciding I would really love to try and get there and to ride a handbike there. And what I did in the beginning was just start going cycling more and more and more. I just got on my bike and I went off to around Scotland, camping, always carrying my kit with me. I just kind of lived on my bike. And because I did that, I just thought I would be really fit to, to race. How little did I know that racing's really different? So we'll go into that a little bit. But I did lack confidence. I didn't believe that I was an athlete at all. It's really easy to look at things like the Olympics or people racing and think that's for somebody else. But, you know, really, it is for any of us if we decide we want to do it. Um, and I read a book all about confidence called Cats and Ants. Well, there was a little model in it called Cats and Ants, which I really liked. And it felt like it really worked for me. So CAT stands for Capability Affirming Thoughts. So the initial thoughts that we have when we have a kind of dream of something that, we, that make us believe that it would be a good idea, that we're going to do well with it. And then ANT stands for automatic negative thoughts. And that's all of the other things that come running into our head about all the reasons why this is crazy, silly, never going to work, etc. And I had millions of ants when it came to trying to be a Paralympian. It just seemed so far-fetched that it, my head was just full of all the reasons why it wasn't going to work. And I've realized, I've put this picture in just as a, as, a, as a metaphor, really, for the way our brain works. Like our brain is wired. I love the, the mind and I work with kind of training people with their minds and coaching around this. So quite a few bits of my talk will refer to this. But our brain is wired to look out for the fears and for the threats and all the things that might go wrong. 
So when we notice all this stuff happening in our head, it's like resistance. It's just like going to the gym to train our muscles. We have to push against weights and get through that and feel some pain before we get stronger. You know, the muscles are breaking and so on. And I believe that our minds are exactly the same, but to push through some of these barriers, these doubts that we have, the ants that are running around our head, the automatic negative thoughts, we have to just notice them, observe them, and then change them and work through them to actually be able to move forward and do things. And most of us have a story that's playing. So I was really aware that my story about going to the Paralympics was, but I'm not an athlete. That's what I kept telling myself. And one day I thought, I can't keep telling myself that because I'm never going to be an athlete if I keep telling myself that I'm not an athlete. I just go slowly for hours. So I decided I had to change my story and change my narrative to something that was a bit more positive or a bit more helpful towards trying to become a Paralympian. So I think at the time I changed it to this, the Olympic experiment. I decided if I called it an experiment, it felt really unthreatening. I was just having a go with something. The idea was that I would If I trained right and well, perhaps I could get to the Paralympic Games in London. And it felt really unthreatening just to call it this. There was nothing to be lost. It was just trying something out, seeing what happened, and that was okay. And that really, really worked for me for a couple of years. But when it got closer to the Paralympics, I realized this isn't an experiment anymore. I've put so much time and effort into it. I actually need this to work now. Like, I want this to work. And I was really fortunate that someone took a picture of me that I actually saw and believed I looked like an athlete. I don't have that picture here just now, but I also took looked back to some of my experiences in other areas of sport and outdoor adventure and how I'd come some overcome some limiting beliefs about what was possible. So because I'd had a climbing accident, it, the idea of going rock climbing again just seemed totally ridiculous. It's like, that's not something that I can do. And then, um, a friend of mine suggested that I go and climb El Capitan with him. And it seemed completely nuts. It's like a kilometer high overhanging rock face in Yosemite National Park. How was I going to do this? But this was kind of in, this was in 2008. So it was kind of at the start of my Paralympic journey. And I thought back to that occasion. I just thought what worked for me then and how can I use all of that to help me now? So when I first saw this rock face, you know, it was completely nuts and I was in denial I, I think I told my mum and dad I was going on a beach holiday to California so they didn't worry and that's what I was really believing was going to happen myself as well but we we did get there and we began this climb and just at the beginning I realized that when I looked up it went on forever looking down even though I didn't used to be scared of heights I was now completely petrified and I was behaving like a bag so I was getting swung out into space and then having to pull myself up the rock face And the combination of these things, the fear of, of, you know, presumably some cells in my body could remember falling off a cliff face. Therefore, there's some trauma in there that's being triggered. And the environment and the scale of it, this kilometer high rock face that was going to take us a week to climb. We were carrying food and water to last for a week. The whole thing was completely and utterly overwhelming. Um, and you'll, for those of you who aren't climbers, here's a little insight into what it's like to be hanging on one of these ledges. How are you feeling, crew? Yeah, good. Except that go. bloody episode. <laughs> literally, madam. How are you feeling, Captain? Am I bad? So, honest to goodness, I was I was literally shaking most of the time when our thoughts allow us to keep keep creating the same negative thoughts, or we still have the we have the same focus on what could go wrong then it has a knock-on effect on our neurochemistry and therefore on our physiology and our emotions. So I was panicky, I was tearful, my body was shaking. All of the reactions that we get when we're in total fear, fight and flight, not sure what to do, scared. And of course, when you're hanging off a big cliff face like this, that's not going to be a good place to be in. So I knew hanging here, I had to do some fairly drastic things to change my mindset. And again, the reason I'm telling this climbing story in the middle of a cycling festival talk is just because... The learning I got from how to work my mindset to then help me in cycling was really, really helpful. So I started to shift how I was seeing being on the rock face here. And actually, I do want to go back to that picture. We have all this stuff in our memory. We have, we have memories. We have habits that we've developed. We've got things that sit in our subconscious mind that drive our behavior and our reactions. And I was obviously having a lot of this coming up, hanging on a cliff, on a cliff face. So what I decided to do and what I found really helped me was to 
just start to bring my mind not to focus on the threats and everything that could go wrong, but to start to really appreciate where I was. So I just started this really strict thing with myself that any time I looked down and started to go into this story of how difficult it was and how scary it was, and I just stopped it, absolutely cut it off, looked out at the horizon, looked around me, took some big deep breaths, and just started to go, wow, look at this place, look at the nature, how amazing is it to be here? How unique is it that some people are willing and want to climb this with me? And how lucky am I to be here? And just completely started taking my thoughts to the positive side, along with um, playing around with some other things to honor the fears that I was having. So all the automatic negative thoughts that were going on. It's like, well, what can I do about each one of those? What's one little thing I can do to make myself feel better? And so I was tied to two ropes, often three ropes, occasionally four ropes, but never to one rope because that helped just suppress the fears I had going on. So what I find really helpful now with anything is listing the worries that I've got, the concerns that I've got, the ants, the negative thoughts, and then just working through the list little by little by little to try and reduce the fear around each of them. And when we do that, it's amazing how we just work through the small things that big things can then change. So I think fear and caution are two different things. Like fear can be completely false. Sometimes fear is real. We're, you know, we actually are, we do have a threat to our life, but often it's based on past experiences that really have no influence over the reality. And we need to just be aware of what's what what is real and what is not real so that we don't end up stuck and never doing anything to kind of move forward. So moving on, I did get to London and in London, I won a silver medal for Britain, which was just beyond belief. It was uh, in the time trial where you set off at one minute intervals. I'd done all sorts of mental training before it alongside the physical training. And I honestly believe that a massive part of my success in London was that work on the mind as much as it was on the body and also mitigating for things that could go wrong. So I'd gone through the race in advance and thought about everything. Like what if someone goes past me? because we're at one minute intervals, if someone goes past you, it basically, you would be like, well, I've lost, I'm never going to win the race. And that could really set you back and go slowly. So it's like, if someone passes me, I could still be second. So just go faster and chase after them. And actually, that's exactly what happened. The American that won did pass me. And uh, I just got on her tail instead of going into a negative thought spiral and did end up getting the silver medal. But it meant I had this opportunity to go forward and continue a career of cycling, which I'd never thought about. It was just a one-off thing to go to London and have some fun and have this experiment. I never imagined for one minute that I'd be going forward into a whole new world of being a competitive cyclist for 13 years, basically. And when we're, when we're doing something for that long, we do need to be really connected with our internal motivation. So I've got this little kind of saying that you've, you've heard me talk about the wibber, but I've broken it down into what, what is the goal? What am I trying to achieve here and, and why? And then the inspiration for it, what's driving me to do this? Why am I excited about this? And unless we can really connect with our inspiration, it's really hard to go out and do the work every day. So I know that I could never have been like a Paralympic swimmer because I just couldn't get inspired to go to a swimming pool every day. But there were all sorts of reasons why I was inspired to get to, to go for this in terms of cycling. Another four years where I was just focused on this as a career, I could be riding a bike as a job, where I could be out in nature, where I had this reason to be out doing this sport that I loved. So, you know, I think we just need to really dig deep into ourselves to figure out what it is that's inspiring us, what our why is. And what our level of belief is. So I didn't have a very high level of belief at the beginning, but the only way that we build up belief towards anything being a reality is just through those step by step by step, a little bit every day, just putting in the commitment. Um, I know many of you will know Jenny Graham, and I know that Jenny hadn't really ridden a bike much until she got onto the round the world thing. And she just began with that, you know, I'm sure it seemed like a completely crazy idea to her at the beginning. And it was just through that daily commitment, the daily work that we get to having something amazing happen. So deciding what action we need to take to make the make, make move things forward. The other thing that really helps me is thinking about where my mind is with the locus of control. So it's really easy to kind of go into victim mode and think, OK, everything's happening to me in life. Um, I, I can't I don't seem to, be able to do anything right. Um, I can't believe this has happened again. Why should I bother? It's all getting told too much, just kind of blaming external circumstances. But if we actually bring it back to ourselves and think, no, we can turn it around. We can make things happen. We can go cycling every day. We can get fit. We can lose weight. We can feel joyful. We can share these experiences with people. And then you can really make it happen. 
So these are the kind of techniques that I was using as I trained really hard for the Rio Paralympics, alongside, of course, many other um, techniques to try and get my fitness to be a maximum. So this is actually inside an altitude chamber. So I'm doing intervals on a, on a trainer inside this chamber, also heat controlled, so we could vary the heat to make it match environments that we'll be going to race in. Um, and then I was sleeping in an altitude tent sometimes in my bed. I was also just trying everything that you could hear of that might help, like drinking beetroot shots and really applying a lot of focus to my nutrition and recovery and all the different aspects that get us to be really good at something. And again, to my mindset. So this is the 2015 World Championships. And I knew that I'd find it difficult because it had a big hill in it. I kept telling myself it would be fine, but the reality is that I am up to about 20 kilos heavier than some of my competitors. I'm six foot tall. I've got both my legs and some of my competitors have amputees. So they're missing quite a lot of weight. It's amazing how sometimes you start to wish that you didn't have legs so that you could be lighter. But of course, I don't delete that thought instantly if I've ever thought it. But I was training for this and trying to just use all the little techniques that I could to be as strong as possible. So I've written DSP on my arms. It stands for dangerously strong and powerful. I've got union jacks on my nails. And the message here is that the more we can put little messages into our environment to help keep bringing our focus to possibility instead of letting our mind take over with negativity, the better. So I plant things around me all the time to stimulate positive thought and to stimulate ideas of what I want to create in life. And I find it really powerful. The other thing that I do a lot, especially before a training session and actually before anything that I'm doing these days is I think about okay, where do I need my focus to be for this next hour? Um, if, we're, if we go out to, to, if I went out to train, for example, but my focus was wandering around into all sorts of other thoughts and going on in my life, then I wouldn't really be putting my best effort into a training session. Equally, if we've got a piece of work to do and our thoughts are all over the place, it's hard to be focused. So I, I really try and bring my focus to the task at hand into the moment. I try and stay open-minded. So whatever's happening, for example, if I'm training hard and my power is telling me that I'm really weak today, I'm like, that's okay. I'm doing the best I can for today. All is good. And I try really hard to manage my energy. So to look after it, to get more tuned into my body and understand when I need to recover or when I might be feeling lazy and it's actually is laziness and other times when it's actually just because you really need to take some time and recover. So just getting more kind of tuned in to your own energy I think it's so important, a bit like brushing our teeth um, as a hygiene thing, how we kind of keep our own energy hygiene going well. So, yeah, uh, I just use this image at the bottom here because some of the early races I did, I found myself looking in the, back, the mirror on my bike and looking behind me and focusing much more on what all my competitors were doing is, rather than what I was doing. And of course, if we focused on everyone else instead of our own game, then we're probably going to get pulled into their world. And fun, sure enough, the, the, the one race that I really did this in a lot, the person who'd been behind me in the whole race, she managed to cross me at the pass me at the finish line, basically, because I just spent the whole time looking at her going, she's catching me, she's catching me. And of course she did. Um, the other thing I try to just be conscious of is how I'm not only what I'm doing with my own thoughts, but when I'm kind of draining the life out of things or when I'm radiating life into things, but also how I'm doing that for other people. So just that idea of how can we radiate more light and more possibility into our lives with, with controlling our thoughts and staying open and how do we replenish our energy. And on the whole, 95% of the time, if I go for a bike ride, it revives me, it replenishes me, it makes me feel better, except maybe if I'm doing some really, really tough intervals or I'm so tired that I shouldn't have gone in the first place. So I love to bear this little quote in mind. If your face is swollen from the severe beatings of life, smile and pretend to be a fat man. So I think there's a lot in the psychology of sport and cycling, you know, going out in the rain in Scotland, whether you're using a bike to commute to work or whatever it might be. It's about embracing what we've got and trying to make the most of that and um, faking it till we make it. And, you know, those days that we, we end up going out in the rain, Sometimes they're so special. We end up with some really special moment where we see the clouds lift or we get this beautiful view and then we're so happy that we're out there. So um, just to continue the story about Rio before I move on and share some other stories, in that World Championships a year out, I was fourth and I was quite a long way down. I was um, a good few minutes beneath the, the, the leader and that seemed like a lot and I could have got really down and negative on myself. I was like, no, back to my brain, keep firing some positive circuits. 
and telling myself it's all good. And I want to tell you about a bit of the brain that really helps with this. It's called the reticular activating system. It's bombarded with energy and it acts as a, sorry, with, with messages um, from our environment, but it's only got the ability to process a very limited amount of this information that's coming into us. So whatever we focus on, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide that explains how this works. So it's a bit technical sounding, but this part of our brain, it filters the information that's coming in and it only takes in information that it thinks is important. And the way it decides what's important is by looking at what we're focusing on. So if we're focusing on winning a gold medal, which at this point in time, I decided to call it Project Gold because I didn't believe I could win a gold medal. I just wanted to see if it was possible and decided calling it a project was quite a good way to do that. Another version of an experiment. So I was focused on gold that my whole life became about giving my brain this message on, on what, how would it be possible to win a gold? So this, my brain was obviously deciding that this was pretty important. And that was then noticing, affecting what I was noticing, what information I'm taking in that affects how we think and then how we feel. And that starts to affect our reality. And I've never really experienced this so acutely as I did with this journey to Rio because I did fill my life with gold. I was talking about Project Gold to everybody. So friends were buying me gold things. This is a gold, giant golden biscuit. I'm not sure that was the greatest nutrition, but telling me to go for gold. I bought gold shoes. I had a gold phone cover. And the whole way through, I was just surrounded by gold in my life. I don't even like gold very much. And I ended up thinking, I really need a bike that feels golden as well. Something that feels extra special and amazing. And this bike doesn't look as aerodynamic as it could be. So I was so fortunate I ended up getting a bike last minute, really, made by Williams Formula One. They initially said no, and then they changed their mind and offered that, well, they got back to me and said four engineers had volunteered to give up all of their free time to make me this incredible bike to race in Rio. It was a bit last minute. It was unveiled just a few weeks before I left to Rio, and I knew that was a risk. But how could I say no to this incredible bike that might not be golden in colour, but it definitely looks it weirdly i nicknamed it supernova i don't know how i came up with that but decided that was a good name it also got called the bat bike but um the kind of posh name was supernova and i only found out recently that apparently gold as in the element of gold is only generated in the center of stars in a supernova someone told me so i was like that's weird anyway um sorry just gonna skip those for you so the journey was on to Rio. I had this incredible bike. I had trained like never before. I had programmed my mind with Project Gold. I had done everything that I could. British Cycling, you'll probably know, talk about marginal gains. How can we get to be X percentage better at something when we're already pretty much at the top of our game? So I just was doing everything I could to get as strong as I could, as fast as I could, taking really good nutrition, just absolutely going for it. But just before arriving in Rio, I ripped a shoulder, a muscle in my shoulder, and I couldn't even push my wheelchair off the bus. So it was a bit shocking, and I didn't know how that was going to go. And again, I was laid in, in a bed in the Olympic Village. On the one hand, my brain going, this is a disaster. You can't even pedal your bike for this whole week before the race. You're not even able to ride the race course and get familiar with it. How, is, how on earth is this ever going to work out to win the gold that you're aiming for? And the other part of me decided, no, don't even go there with those thoughts. And it had become so unconscious by this point that I was just automatically reframing it and going, this could be perfect. Maybe I need a rest and this will be the perfect way to go into the race fresh and everything will go really well. So I was telling myself that and um, got to the start of the race. In the middle of the race, my chain fell off. So I had to actually stop, put the brakes on, pick the chain up and put it back on again, which was pretty crazy. But um, I'm going to share this video with you because it, it just sums up um, what happened. Um, I did win the gold medal. I don't, actually, I don't know if this video shows that, but it's, um, it was my reflections afterwards about what happens when we bring together this sort of weird synergy of, of focus, of some level of belief that we've developed on, on seeing things as an experiment, as a project, playing with it, just going through that hard work every single day. And it was really quite a profound experience for me. So I'm just going to give you a little insight into what it was like there in Rio. It's quite an atmospheric bit of video.
in my religion. Trike racing is really dangerous, you're really wobbly. You really have to believe that you can do it and get around that corner and have faith because sometimes it's completely impossible to do it. You know, you think, how on earth can I do it? And then you do it. You know, you really have to just think, I've done my training or I've done, I can get up that hill. Because sometimes you look at a massive hill and think, I can't get up that. But as soon as you do it, you realise you can do it. So yeah, cycling is a really good thing because you have to take that belief all the time and you have to be really, really brave all the time. And it's taught me a lot. If I hadn't won, the biggest thing I would have been disappointed about would be that the belief hadn't come true. And I think winning makes me believe that believing works, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, life is difficult for everybody in different ways. And if we don't have faith that it can be good or faith that we can achieve something, then what do we have? That's what keeps us going through the difficult times. Or that's what gives us energy to get up in the morning and really work towards something because we believe it could be possible. The years and the months and the weeks and the days and the moment of the race, so many things went wrong. And then even in the race, my chain fell off and I thought, oh, how am I not going to win now? And then I did. We have to just never, ever give up, even when it seems like we have no chance anymore, because sometimes we do. <laughs> So that camaraderie is one of the things that I really love about, about sport and the Paralympics is an incredible place to be, not just to be inspired by other athletes and the dedication and everything they're putting in, but also by the people behind them. You know, that the, the lady there is the wife of the guy that had won and just to see the joy on their faces and just to know all of the work and the support and everything that they put into it as well. It's really, really very moving, I think. So um, in Rio, I discovered through this little video I'm going to skip this one though it's the first 100 medals in 100 seconds for Britain it's a nice little little summary with some great faces and smiles in it but I discovered through this that I'd won the 79th medal for Britain and it was really weird because all summer there'd been a joke with me and the number 79 I'd been going to a cafe and the people and asking for my drinks extra hot and the woman in the cafe had said ask for them at 79 degrees that's the hottest the machine goes and of course, all my teammates were just joking and calling me a diva for asking for this. So it was really weird when I discovered that I'd won the 79th medal. I'd also forgotten that 79 is the atomic number of gold. And before I was a cyclist, I was a geologist studying gold. So I don't know how I'd forgotten that, but I got really interested and it got me thinking about how when we step out of our comfort zones and take on something new for ourselves that we've maybe never done before, it really... Um, teach helps us find things inside ourselves like confidence that we never had before and I'm, I'm calling that our inner gold so I began this project called quest 79 and it was asking other people to take a challenge for themselves to help them to help find some gold inside them and there's been some incredible stories uh, just some really wonderful things happening um from a young boy from the Isle of Sky decided to climb 79 peaks in 79 weeks my dad decided to cycle 79 miles for 79 years. Um, lots of people that had never ridden before have started doing bike rides for 79 minutes or 79 days or 79 kilometers. And they're not all cycling related, there's all sorts. But if you're interested to learn more about that, then go and have a look at the Quest 79 website, which is just quest79.com. And you'll find some stories and videos there that I hope will give you a bit of inspiration and Maybe we'll even encourage you to go and sign up and put your own quest in as well. So, um, yeah, so I decided I would begin a new quest and it would be seven continents and nine big rides. 
So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to whiz you through some images of some of these rides because they're uh, it got me into some very interesting scenarios and some incredible experiences through this passion I have for cycling. So one of them was with the University of Liverpool, where we ended up in a bike inside this egg-like thing. So inside that bullet thing is a hand bike, and it's been made to be super aerodynamic. And the plan was that myself and Ken, who's based in Edinburgh, would share this bike and race it across the Nevada desert and try and break the land speed record for hand biking. It was one of the craziest, scariest projects of my life I've ever got involved in. I had no prior training in this bike. Ken did, but I I got to sit in it once on a runway in Liverpool before going out to Nevada. And you can see there's a little tiny black thing sticking up towards the back. That's a little periscope, which comes down to a screen the size of a mobile phone inside, which has the road in front of you on it. So you've got this kind of very distorted relationship with the road and the screen And you're going along at a pretty fast speed. I think my maximum speed was around, I was aiming for 79 kilometers an hour. That was my goal to try and break the land speed record with. Um, I think I reached 79 at one point, but not in the speed gates, which were at the end of the journey where you see those yellow bollards. But it was just this incredible immersion in this world of people that are so passionate about cycling and inventing crazy bikes. There were two wheel bikes. We were the only hand bike there actually. Everyone else was on two wheels with these unbelievable designs from all over the world trying to break land speed records. And I think that's one of the things that I love about cycling is just the diversity, the diversity of it. One of the other incredible special journeys that emerged from this was I was very fortunate to spend time in northern Ethiopia in the Simeon Mountains, which unfortunately since have become very well it's very challenged with civil war but the team we had a team of Ethiopians with us and a couple of them were ex well many of them were ex-professional cyclists who have ridden big tours and some of them what a couple of cyclists that turned up to join us as as guests are still professional riders with big tours but uh, it's a bit depressing when the hills were so big and so steep and it was so hot that you can see here one of the our support crew is walking next to me with an umbrella to shake me from the sun because it was 45 degrees and he could actually walk quicker than I could hand bike up these hills because they were so, so enormous. But, you know, again, I think that's one of the things I love about cycling is just that possibility to travel through countries in this way where you're so much more connected to not just the landscape, but the people. And, you know, i where else would you ride past a bunch of guys with giant machine guns and have a chat with them? I mean, crazy situations that this world of cycling has has enabled me to get into, I think. Um, And that image there is in Ethiopia. It was one of the most incredible rides of my life, but actually probably the hardest, hardest, hardest ride I've ever done just because we're at altitude and super hot as well. But one of the most special of these rides that I've taken was through Patagonia with this group of very special friends. Two teammates, uh, Jacko is missing an arm, he has a carbon arm, and Steve in the middle is losing his eyesight, Steve Bates, you may have come across him, and he is also a Paralympic cyclist, um, won gold medals in Rio, and his wife Caroline, who had never done anything like this before, she'd never camping toured with a bike or... And this was our big prize after Rio. We decided that we needed a recovery ride, that we needed a big dose of nature and beautiful mountains. And we played a party game one Christmas and had various locations. And it ended up being Patagonia that we decided we would try and journey through with our bikes and our camping gear and just really enter into the wilderness. So um, the guys were total heroes. They carried trailers behind their bikes with fat bikes and my wheelchair was on the back of one of those trailers. So super lucky that I was able to get that support. I was injured with my shoulder still from Rio. I was awaiting shoulder surgery, but you know what? I rode this ride and I canceled the surgery by the end of it. I really believe that when we're not pushing, when we get our body and our system back in balance and we get exposed to so much nature, then our bodies just want to heal and often find a way to do that. Um, So I'm just going to finish my my words and my talking. So there's time to have some conversation and questions with this little video of that journey, which uh, I think you'll just feel the energy and the passion and the the nature and the camaraderie and the fun that we had on this. You 
kind of miss the only thing you miss The harder you are trying, the deeper you're subsiding Remembering to forget Something is diverting, something in your mind It's stuck like tongues on a kilometers lots of pushing uphill god knows what time it is about nine o'clock here we go this is what we came for So we cycle to the end of a long dirt road in the middle of nowhere with absolutely nothing there, arriving really late at night in the pouring rain. And, you know, that's what the fun of it all is. We're not really going there to seek anything. There's nothing at the end of it. There's just the journey and the friendship and that connection for me with, with the beauty of nature and that strengthening connection with our own bodies. So, um, yeah, these are the four ingredients that have got me through everything. Being, having, finding that courage somehow just to step into the unknown and dare to do things. We're human, so we run out of energy, we run out of inspiration. We give it to each other, it's all around us. We just need to look for it, be that in a sunset or in the words of another person. Sometimes we have to put in the hard work, train hard, put in the, the days and cycle in the rain and do whatever it might be. But more than anything, and I think this is what I love most about my life cycling is um, just the love that we can give to ourselves, to each other, that's all around us in the environments that we're in. And just, uh, you know, just that is, I think it's love that makes the world go round. And for me, I am definitely in love with my bike. <laughs> anyway, that's a bit cliche, but uh, a perfect way to end up a cycling about, a talk about cycling, I think. So I'm going to stop there and perhaps we can have some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. That was great. Um, if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to ask, please put them in the Q&A box at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen next to the raise hand and the more buttons. Um, and Lorna and I can read them out. But not, in, not just you just add comments as well, like maybe you resonate with it. You could tell me why you, you know, what where you're at. Like I'd love to hear if there's people listening that are starting out cycling or where you are on your journey, if you, if you want any ideas or help or even just a comment. Oh, you're being shy. <laughs> well, in the meantime, we've got... Hi, David. Yeah, I can see it. I've put them up. What am I planning next? Yeah, well, you know, what's interesting is that I'm um, redefining my relationship with my bike because for 13 years, it's all been about training for Paralympics. So the ability to have those kind of adventurous bike rides, although I managed to get quite a few of them in there, it's not, I've had to be really strict, really following a regime. So I just retired from racing this summer. So it's relatively new for me and I've had some health challenges actually. So it's been a bit of a rocky summer on that front. So I've probably ridden my bike less than ever, but I do have one um, continent remaining of the seven rides that I've been taking part in. And I don't take it lightly because I'm sure many of you listening will get this, but most of us that ride bikes a lot 
have a lot of respect and compassion for our environment and wanting to protect it and look after it. So I always have this dilemma about, I also have this passion for traveling the world and discovering other cultures and sharing time with people in these other environments. And it's really a bit challenging sometimes to think, how do you travel to these places and how do you justify it? And the continent I've got left is Antarctica. And that's like the ultimate in terms of protection, we need to protect it and how special it is and how much, not just um, impact, but money it takes to get there. So in the process, however, I discovered that 79 degrees latitude and longitude intersects in Antarctica. And it just was like, I've got no interest in doing anything like going to the South Pole. And I'm really, really interested in trying to get a bike to work in this environment. Um, so I've been working with ICE tricycles, ICE inspired cycle engineering. They have a tricycle, which uh, the first person to ever cycle to the South Pole did on an ICE tricycle. And they've developed a hand bike version of it. And the mission is to try and go to 79 degrees latitude and longitude to create a new pole called the Pole of Possibility. Um, we're working with a couple of charities, the Spinal Injuries Association, but also a Scottish charity called the Polar Academy. Um, and the aim is to really try, and one of the students from the Polar Academy is coming on the journey with me. And what we just really want to do is get to this point, be it by bike or ski, <laughs> and try and communicate a, a message of hope and possibility about what we can all do as individuals and actually how when we do things individually, it can really have a knock-on effect. And I had a really lovely conversation with Iona about what her inspiration to come on this journey was. And we decided it was about, we, we, we chatted about it and three main things came out and I nearly wet myself with excitement when I discovered that they spell ice because we didn't plan for them to, but they do. Uh, and it was about inner gold, connection and environment. And I think that kind of maybe sums up the three ingredients that cycling definitely gives to me. So that is what I'm planning next. It's a big project. It's an expensive project. It needs to be really meaningful for me to be able to feel it's valid to go there so it's uh, a lot of work but yeah maybe that answers the question alongside redefining my relationship with a bike in a more uh, balanced way that's not being a full-time athlete and um, thank you anonymous attendee for your question and uh, yeah I, I thank you for coming again even though you've heard me before I'm really conscious that I have only got so many stories so if people have heard me before I hope I'm not repeating myself too much but hopefully I, I don't have a script so different things and different memories crop up with each one but thank you very much um Julie you missed the start of the talk how do I think we can inspire more young women into cycling yeah great um I mean we can't force people to do things can we but I think the more that we embrace what we're passionate about and do it and share stories and have events like this. I mean, it's really special that this series of talks is happening. And, you know, and I think about my own journey with confidence at the beginning of cycling and also during my journey, because you saw in the video at the beginning, I've been, I've had quite a lot of accidents on my bike too. I've been hit by a car. I was hit by a bus in Mallorca and narrowly survived the wheel the back wheels of the bus were coming straight for me and it was only the side of the coach managed to touch my back wheel and suddenly prized me off the road and tipped me into a ditch which meant the back wheels didn't hit me and so all of these things like the fears that we have about the, the danger or our own confidence they're all things that can really set us back um, but I think the more people that are cycling, the more people that are talking about it, the more that there are groups doing it, the more that we can just realise the benefits of it and how they massively outweigh the potential risks, um, then the better. So I hope that's one perspective on it. I'm sure you've got many more. And I know I've got friends in Vanessa that are organising a big event for a couple of weeks time called Kiddical Mass, where there's going to be tons of kids and families all cycling around the town. And I think it's just about visibility and awareness. And I spend quite a lot of my time in Mallorca training and there's so many bikes there, especially in the spring, that the drivers are just so much more cautious and respectful because there's just that visibility of seeing it happen. So hopefully just more of it will just gradually shift the approach and, yeah, inspire more people to get into it. Great question. Any more questions or comments or from either of you, Rosie or Lorna? Yeah, we've got some prepared questions we can go into in the meantime. If anything else crops up for anyone, feel free to add it in. We can go back to them afterwards. Um, 
I think, yeah, what you're saying, everything is so motivating. And a lot of the advice that you gave is like really applicable to like many different aspects of life and just like a general approach to different challenges and not just cycling based. Um, how did you find it building up that mentality and what helped to keep you so positive when you were going through that? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I have nearly, I just had a very near miss with my health this summer, actually, which I've, I ended up having this weird thing where I was laid in a hospital in Iceland, reflecting about all these times when I've nearly not been here anymore and realized it's, I think I'm onto my ninth life. And so I think when we go through these challenges, um, it's not easy when we fall down to get back up again. And um, I suppose right through the process of all these different events from becoming paralyzed to the other things that have happened to me since, I have this question in my mind of, well, what is the choice? Like we can give up and we can, um, we can give up on dreams, we can give up on our health, we can give up on so many different aspects. But actually for me, it's all about how can we feel the best that we can in life? How can we be the best of ourselves? How can we have more energy? How can we keep trying? How can we keep going? How can we share this journey, this wonderful journey of adventure that life is with other people? So I suppose I fairly instantly flipped things to reframe it. There's an expression you might have heard called reframing. But whenever my mind might go to the downside of something, there's usually an upside and there's usually something positive to be found in it and to be gained, gained in it. And I think that slide I shared early on about what can I learn from this and then how might this help me in the future and potentially how might, might, might it help other people is really motivating so that when we're going through struggle, we can start to ask those questions and usually find some really good reasons in it or just tell ourselves that there are good reasons. We just haven't maybe found them yet, <laughs> but we usually do. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I suppose that's a bit of an insight into my process. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> I think that answers it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm conscious we're running out of time. So if anyone's got any last questions, add them in. But um, while they do, I will ask. Um, so you've, you've mentioned about your sort of support teams um, a little. Could you just explain a little bit of sort of what roles those support teams are made up of? So what kind of roles are people um, providing when they're when they're on sort of those long rides with you, either racing or um, that trip? Oh yeah, so very, very different setup. So the racing world is one thing because I've been part of UK Sport, the Scottish Institute of Sport, and there are clearly many support roles there from physiology to nutrition to psychology to gym coaches to bike coaches um, to team managers. There's like so much support there, which once when you're in the system, um, which I'm very privileged to have been able to have access to for many years now. I'm not in that system anymore. And the journeys that I've done with friends or strangers, many of those journeys that I started to describe there and those others that I didn't go into have, have, have happened with people that have never, ever taken bike journeys before. I seem to have this ability to attract people to, maybe they kind of look at me in the handbike and go, well, if she can do it, maybe I can do it too. Like there's something about my about my situation or my my thirst for just going and doing these things and not really thinking about the detail too much sometimes uh, that maybe inspires others to go well maybe I can too so nearly all of those rides have just been with people that either have never done anything like that sometimes strangers then they've never been experienced support teams at all um, but clearly there's many of the rides where there've been friends who are strong enough or willing enough to tow a wheelchair on a trailer. There's been a couple of rides where I've towed my own wheelchair where I realized that my friend, even though they were willing, wasn't maybe fit enough for it. And I've kind of forgotten that I basically have been training full time on a bike, whereas many people are holding down full time jobs and maybe only getting out cycling once or twice a week. And there's, so, so, so to be suddenly doing 100 plus kilometers a day on a long journey is a bit of overwhelm so um yeah it's really varied but I think the support I've had on the longer rides is really just about friendship and companionship and sharing the experience together with people that's really special great well thank you so much Rosie did you have another question or were you going to wrap up there we've got more questions but perhaps it's it's better just to wrap up go on ask one more and then we'll, we'll stop there <laughs>
Um, one thing I wanted to ask was we've met a couple of people through the festival who've said that they've been get, getting back into cycling after having an injury. And I wondered if there was any advice you could provide to people for like overcoming those feelings that reflect trepidation that you first have after you've experienced something, especially if you've got the injury through cycling, how yeah. you have overcome that and get back into it. Yeah, so definitely. Um, I think there's different kinds of injuries. There's the physical injury and then there's maybe the psychological injury. If you've fallen off um, and broken something or been hit by something, I don't know what. So I've had both. With physical injuries, I really have realized that um, prevention is better than cure. So proactive, not reactive, if you know what I mean. So I try really hard to regularly get some physio or massage. Um, when I was in the thick of training, that would be once a week. Now it's more like once every three weeks or once a month. Um, and then I've got my own massage device that I use on myself. But you can get lots of these machines now that you can self, you know, vib the big vibrating things that you can get on your muscles and release tension and so on. And then also I do a lot of a, a reasonable amount of gym work to make sure I'm stretching. And, you know, I think we'd call them, I don't know what you'd call them, but kind of recovery activities where you really tune into your body and you become really aware of your body. Things like yoga or meditation or massage or stretching or dancing or things where you kind of have the finer movements of the body. And I think if we engage with those alongside cycling, it enables us to look after the body and strengthen the parts. And I find when I do those things alongside it, often injuries resolve themselves quite easily or don't even happen in the first place. And when I have had bad injuries, then yeah, I, people say, you know, you need to, some people might say you need to rest. I always believe that actually don't maybe do the intense stuff, but usually movement equals blood circulation equals more chance of healing and still keeping your mind strong and positive is so important. So when I've been injured, I'll just ride easy for a while, but I'll probably still go out every day or I might need help to get in my bike or get out of my bike because I'm so injured that I can't do those movements, but I still try to engage with it and keep the blood circulating. So, um, and kinesio tape is amazing stuff. I don't know how on earth it really works, how much of its placebo effects and how much of it is really an actual physical effect, but I often stick it onto muscles if they've got a tweak or a pull and I find it really supportive. So yeah, a mixture of approaches, but definitely proactive and not stopping if possible. I have spent, a, I did have to spend a month before Rio laid on my tummy with an injury to my backside from cycling over the Bialik in Scotland. I got a kind of pressure sore where the waterproof backing and my seat cover had rubbed up on the inside and created this sore. So Again, that was interesting because you're like training for a Paralympic Games. You can't actually be on your backside all day sat in a wheelchair. So I just have to lay on my tummy for basically 22 and a half hours of the day. And the other hour and a half, I went and did a training session. <laughs> so, yeah, just managing it in a way that works for you. Oh, and psychologically, I think getting back to it as soon as possible, but with support. So I've done quite a lot of work with things like hypnotherapy and eye movement techniques to release trauma but also if I've had an accident which has kind of created a psychological trauma in some way or that fear I will start back but do it with support make sure someone's maybe riding out with me or just build up gradually so that you kind of desensitize yourself to that trigger and uh, seem to get through that and resolve the trauma through other kinds of work as well. That's great. Thank you so much. That was, yeah, really inspiring to hear. Um, and I hope it was useful ever, for everyone who's been able to attend today. Um, we'll make sure to upload the recording afterwards so you can share it with other people you think it might be useful for too. But yeah, thank you so much, Karen. And thank you. For hey, thanks for the questions. And thank you, everyone that's been along and listened. And, and yeah, thanks. Privilege. <laughs>